Sometimes you just want to build something over the top, something that's totally for yourself. I'm Kerry Arms. I'm one of the owners of CSS, and I'm going to show you how I turned $3,500 in parts into a $35,000 speaker. I want to start by talking about why I'm building this speaker today. For the last eight years, Dan and I have put basically all of our energy into growing CSS. Essentially, all of our free time has been dedicated to making CSS better, and that's paid off for us in the long run. We were both able to quit our day jobs a few years ago and work here full time. It's basically been a dream come true, but sometimes it isn't as cool as you would think. Our kits are the main products we sell, and we try to make sure that they are extremely well designed, not only sonically, but also from the standpoint of assembly packaging, etc. And this means that most of the new speakers I built over the last several years have been things we released for CSS. While this has been awesome, and I think most of our customers would agree that it's time well spent, it's left a bit of a creative hole in my life. Both of us used to build several speakers a year as a hobby before CSS, but since we've started, I've only built one for personal use and one for my brother. Our core products have to be designed so that they are easy to build, ship well, and sound great. But sometimes I just want to build something extreme. Something that doesn't make sense to send to a first time or even an experienced builder because it's really complicated or just impossible to put in kit form. Something that has visual touches that would be really hard to put into a kit. Not only is this speaker one of those projects, but it's a statement of where we're going with the majority of our future YouTube videos. We want to use YouTube as an outlet for getting back into our passion of building really cool speakers. We want to continue making great products for customers, but also refine the passion that we had for building really cool things. This speaker started with me wanting to use six of our LDW7 woofers per side. Because of the relatively high minimum impedance of these woofers, it's possible to run these in two groups of three in parallel, and then series each of those groups together to get an overall minimum impedance of a little over five ohms. This will end up with a really easy load for an amplifier to drive, and a relatively high sensitivity. Based on the initial calculations, it looks like I'll be around 95 to 96 dB before any baffle step, and based on the room loading with these, I don't think that I'll be using full baffle step, so maybe around 92 to 93 dB after baffle step. This posed a challenge because our current tweeters that we carry don't really have enough sensitivity to keep up with this, especially after you start to add shaping circuits, because that can reduce the output a little bit uh, just to match up in the crossover. So the next thought was, why not a 2.5 way? Well, when you've got parallel groups of three, this becomes really challenging. If we had parallel groups of two, this would be something that's possible. That effectively left me with a design using a tweeter that we don't carry and some other mid-range driver. Getting the mid-range sensitivity high enough meant that I'd likely need to go with an MTM arrangement for the midsection, but this would make an already tall cabinet even taller. To get the volume that I needed for the LDW7s to extend the base where I wanted it, in an MTM arrangement the cabinet was going to be over 7 feet tall. What I finally ended up deciding on was a Pro Audio driver from Fatal Pro. It's a coax driver so it kept the height down and it also had the output that I needed to mate up to the 6 LDW7s. So here's the initial sketch I came up with, which ends up being about five foot, six inches tall. And after about two and a half days of cutting, here are the panels that I had. Now I needed to cut some holes in the panels for braces. And there are a few different ways you can do this. And each of them have advantages and disadvantages. You can see Dan here using a hole saw, which will cut very circular holes, but it can overheat your drill and it's a little bit harder on your hands. You can also use a jigsaw, which is a little rougher but works well with big cuts, or a scroll saw, which works really well for small cuts. This is one of my least favorite parts of building speakers, cutting holes for braces. So I tried all three methods to see what was the fastest, and what I ended up doing for the most part was using the jigsaw here. It doesn't matter that the holes are not very clean on the inside. It won't affect anything acoustically, 
And the only reason I'm using a chamfer bit here is just to save my knuckles as I'm wiring up the cabinet. I like to use a pin nailer here to hold the panels in place while I'm gluing up. It doesn't provide any real clamping pressure, but it does help prevent the panels from sliding around while you are clamping them. And now you can watch as I progressively move further and further out of shot here as I glue up one of the top or bottom sections of the cabinet. Somehow out of the roughly 65 panels that I cut, one of them ended up about a quarter inch short. So I'm gonna use some Bondo here to fill in that gap. This edge will be painted, so it's not that big of a deal, but if you're going to veneer, you need to make sure you're not using Bondo because the veneer glue won't stick to it. This cabinet's going to have a double thick front baffle and I'm laying out the holes for the inner baffle through cuts are going to be. I use a Jasper circle jig to cut all of these holes. I managed to miscut one of the through holes too small. So I'm using the off cut from one of the correct sized holes, centered and glued in place with CA glue to hold my pen and recut the hole. The plan is to use the back section of the mid cabinet to hold the crossover. So I need binding posts coming out of each of the cabinets to be able to connect everything up back here. So I need to make a cutout that will allow the binding posts to pass through from the lower and upper cabinets into the mid cabinet. So I've made a template here that I'm going to flush trim with a router on both the top and bottom sides of the mid cabinet. Now it's time to start sanding the cabinets and getting them prepped for veneer and paint. I'm caulking the seams on the back of the cabinet here just to make it look a little nicer once it's painted. Then I'm moving on to drilling the holes for the binding posts coming out of the mid cabinet. I wanted to connect the top and bottom cabinets with threaded inserts and nice machine screws. So I made a template to make sure that my holes all lined up in the same place. Then I moved on to spraying the woofer cabinets before I did the veneer work. I primed and sprayed them black, but I didn't get spraying the black on camera. Next, we need to trim both the oak paperback veneer and the raw walnut veneer, and I'm doing this the same way. I'm using a fresh blade on a utility knife and just making a lot of shallow passes to make sure I don't tear out the veneer. Now I need to trim some veneer to use on the middle section of the cabinet. This is raw walnut and I'm going to need to seam the panels. So we're going to join the edges up together on the two sides that we want to join. And then I'm going to use a sharp block plane just to make sure these edges are perfect.
When seaming raw veneer, you want to start with the back side first. This will be the side that you want to glue to the cabinet. So get everything lined up how you want it and then tape the seam as tight as you can with painter's tape. Then we'll flip the piece over and use veneer tape to cover that seam. Veneer tape has a water activated adhesive, a lot like old stamps, and it shrinks as it dries so it'll start to pull the seam a lot tighter. The raw veneer is going to be pressed in the veneer press. For the paperback veneer, I use the iron-on method, but I didn't get that on camera. If you want to see a good example, take a look at Dan's last video where he did the base module redux. When you trim paperback veneer, a lot of times you'll get this little edge that sticks to the cabinet and doesn't want to come off. So what I found is the best way to clean this up is a really sharp plane. So I'm showing you here how I use the block plane just to clean this up. Now I need to cut holes for the port in the woofer sections of the cabinets. I'm gonna use three inch PVC pipe for the port that I'll spray black, but I wanted the edge to look a little nicer. So I got these copper trim rings cut from Send Cut Send. I'm a little too mature to make some joke here about how tight this hole was. All I'll let you know is that I really had to pound this pipe in. Now I need to move on to cutting the recesses and through holes for the outer baffle. I wanted to put an edge profile on the baffle as well, and I ended up choosing a thumbnail tabletop bit for this. It gives a nice shallow slope on the outside edge. Because of the odd shaped frame on the coax, I used a template here to cut the rebate You'll need to make sure you mark your center before you do this because you'll still need to cut a round through hole. I went with Rubio Monocoat on the walnut here, not because I think it's the best finish ever, but because I really wanted the matte finish to contrast with the satin black lacquer on the oak and the shine of the copper.
For installing the outer baffles, I'm trying out a new technique I saw in a video from Usher Audio. They lined the edges of the sub baffle with gasket tape and then used what looked like construction adhesive to attach the outer baffle. This allows you to finish the outer baffle separately and provides a nice even shadow line along the joint without the risk of glue squeeze out. After doing some testing, I ended up using a liquid flashing material, which had a really strong adhesion, but remained somewhat flexible to provide extra damping. This build ended up having about $300 worth of solid copper going into it. Here I'm cutting down trim pieces for the middle cabinet. I'm attaching these with screws rather than trying to glue it. This allows me to attach and then remove the pieces later as needed. You might be wondering why I'm using polyfill here and not some other type of material. Based on all of the testing I've seen, including research done in AES papers, polyfill is as effective as any other type of damping material in the base frequencies. You'll notice that I used denim insulation in the mid-range cabinet because in the mid-range frequencies, denim insulation is a little more effective. If you're just starting out building speakers, you don't need an anechoic chamber. You can get good measurements by maximizing the distance to all of your boundaries and using proper measurement techniques. We'll do a video at some point on how to measure your speakers, but we've rented time in an anechoic chamber as well as having some of our speakers independently clippled. And what we found is that the measurements that we get align almost identically with these other options. I decided to go with a brushed finish on the copper rather than polishing it. I like the look of the brush finish a little bit better and it still has a lot of shine that contrasts with the satin and the matte finish already on the cabinet. The copper will tarnish very quickly though after touching it, so you need to make sure you spray it quickly with some type of barrier protection. Here I'm using a special lacquer that's meant for brass and works well on copper. You might be thinking these binding post plates would look a lot better inset, and you'd be right. Unfortunately, I got to the end of the build and realized that I hadn't actually recessed these, and when I started trying to figure out how I was going to do that, I realized that we don't have a bit to make the radius on the corners of these, so I need to do a little more planning before I'm able to do that. I do intend to go back and actually recess these at some point, just to make the build look a little bit cleaner. I'm using some E6000 epoxy to attach the copper rings around the port opening. I find that the E6000 works well with mixed materials like this because it has a little bit of flexibility and it allows for changes in the expansion rate between the different types of materials. We're in the home stretch now in terms of the cabinet build. We're wrapping up the last remaining pieces, but unfortunately I ran out of time on this project and wasn't able to get crossover design done in the one month that we allotted each other for these builds. I also have a few other last minute touches that I wanted to add. I'm planning to build a grill for the back of the mid chamber, 
where the crossover is going to be stored to cover it up. I also need to make 3D printed crossover boards to make the components look very nice. And what I realized is all of this was way too much for a 30 day project. I think I might have gotten a little too ambitious on this trying to build six separate cabinets. And in the future, I think I may stick to no more than four. Totaling up the build here, we've got about $2,700 worth of drivers, around $400 in veneer, $300 in copper, and another hundred or so dollars in random other parts. That brings the total material cost up to $3,500. Now, on top of this, I've also put in about 200 hours worth of work, and I'm still not quite done with this. I probably have another 20 to 40 hours left to finish up crossover design, assembly, and building the grill for the crossover chamber. So now I present the mostly finished final product. Tell me what you think. And if you like these build videos and you want to see more of this, make sure you like and subscribe and leave us a comment telling us how you do things differently.